In this section, we're going to talk about the thermodynamics governing spontaneous electron transfer during a redox reaction. In returning to this physics example, where an electron spontaneously moves in between these two metal plates, we have this equation where the change in energy or the change in the electric potential energy is equal to the product of the charge of this electron times the voltage between these two charged metal plates. And the spontaneous direction is from high potential electric energy to low potential electric energy. In the voltaic cell, electrons also move spontaneously from high potential energy to low potential energy across two metal electrodes. And the voltage difference between these two metal electrodes was called the cell potential. Now, in this redox reaction, zinc loses electrons to copper 2 plus to form copper metal and zinc 2 plus. For this redox reaction, we can also calculate the change in energy. This would now be the change in the free energy of this reaction, and it's also equal to a product that has the voltage or the cell potential and the charge, which is represented by the moles of electrons, n, times Faraday's constant, f. Now, the reason for the negative sign is that for spontaneity, delta G must be negative, but cell potential is positive. So this negative sign helps capture that relationship. This important thermodynamic relationship between the free energy change and the cell potential also works for the standard state. In that case, you'll want to use delta G naught with E naught, or the cell potential at standard state. Now, when using these equations, you do want to be mindful of the units. So again, delta G has units of kilojoules per mole. N is standing for the moles of electrons. And so this will be a number of the moles of electrons that are transferred per mole of redox reaction. F is Faraday's constant, and this is equating the amount of charge here in coulombs per mole of electron. Cell potential, our last variable here, has units of volts. And from physics, we know that one volt is equal to one joules over one coulomb. Coming back to Faraday's constant, a more useful form is shown here where it's equal to 96.5 kilojoules per volt per mole electron. So this equation is really important for determining spontaneity. So for a redox reaction to be spontaneous, that would mean the free energy change is negative and the cell potential is positive. When the redox reaction reaches equilibrium and all net reaction stops, that again means that the free energy change is zero and the cell potential is also zero. Now, if the free energy change is positive or if the cell potential is negative, that corresponds to a non-spontaneous redox reaction as written but it also means that the reverse redox reaction would be spontaneous. The standard state serves as a great reference for comparing the driving force of different chemical reactions. And by looking at redox reactions, we can look at driving force in terms of the standard free energy change and also the standard cell potential. Another good indicator of driving force was the equilibrium constant. And so using this equation from the thermodynamics chapter, we can now plug in minus RT times the natural log of the equilibrium constant K into this top equation. And then by rearranging, we can derive a new relationship between the standard cell potential and the equilibrium constant. This triangle on the right is another good way to represent this three-way relationship between the standard free energy change, the standard cell potential, 
and the equilibrium constant. So we have this thermodynamic relationship between delta G naught and K, as well as delta G naught and E naught. And using these two relationships, we can derive this third one here between E naught and K. And these all apply specifically for the standard state. A more usable form for this last equation here at the bottom of the triangle is given here. So what we've done is we've plugged in the ideal gas constant R, room temperature for T, and Faraday's constant. And we've also changed natural log to log. And so this gives us this new equation form that's much easier to use, where we have 0.0592 volts over the moles of electrons times the log of the equilibrium constant. Most redox reactions do not occur at the standard state. And so we also want to derive relationships not in terms of the standard cell potential, but rather the cell potential. So using this equation, and the one previously from our thermodynamics chapter, where delta G is equal to delta G naught plus RT times the natural log of the reaction quotient Q, we can combine these two equations and solve for the cell potential, which is equal to the standard cell potential minus RT over NF times the natural log of Q. This important equation is called the Nernst equation. The triangle on the right here again shows this three-way relationship between delta G, cell potential, and the reaction quotient Q. And again, these important thermodynamic equations along these two sides can be combined to derive the Nernst equation shown at the bottom. A more usable form of the Nernst equation is given here and we've restricted the temperature to be at 25 degrees Celsius. And we've also taken the constants R and F and put them in, as well as changed the natural log to the log. And so this becomes a much easier equation to use. What the Nernst equation shows us is that the driving force for a redox reaction, or the cell potential, can be thought of as a sum of two terms. The first term is just the standard cell potential, which is that potential difference that depends on the two metal electrodes that are used at the standard state. The second term really depends largely on Q, or the reaction quotient. And this is where the concentrations of the products over the concentration of the reactants also add to the driving force of the redox reaction. This is an example of electrochemical cell where in each of these half cells we have the same metal and metal ion species. So here both these electrodes are copper and we have solutions of copper 2 plus. And the question is can the following cell do work i.e. will it produce spontaneous electron transfer between these two half cells. In this special cell, the standard cell potential is zero. We have no potential difference when we have the same metal and metal ion combinations in the two half cells. Moreover, at the standard state, their concentrations are equal, so there's no driving force for electron transfer. Another way to think about this is to look at the equation for determining the standard cell potential, and that can be thought of as in these two terms, or the half-cell potentials. And because each of these half-cell reactions are the same but opposite, they would perfectly cancel out to zero. The cell potential for any electrochemical cell can be determined using the Nernst equation. So in this type of special cell, we know that the standard cell potential is zero. But the second term, where Q features, is where we can have another contribution to this driving force. You might notice in the figure that the concentrations of copper 2 plus 
are different in these two half cells. So even though we have a standard cell potential of zero, it's this difference in concentration that can provide a driving force for spontaneous electron transfer. And this type of cell is called a concentration cell. If we were to start with this concentration cell on the left, where the two half cells have different concentrations of copper two plus ions, then we would be able to see spontaneous electron transfer and the ability of the cell to do work until it reaches an equilibrium state where now the concentrations of copper two plus ions are identical in the two half cells. You might also wonder about the changes in the amount of copper metal and whether that would affect equilibrium. So the answer is no, because pure solids have an active concentration of one and they do not change during the reaction and also pure metals do not appear in the reaction quotient Q. In this overall redox reaction, where the products and the reactants are identical, then the equilibrium constant will be equal to one. And so at equilibrium, Q will be equal to K, and both of them would be equal to one. In the next part of the problem, we're gonna determine the cell potential for this concentration cell. And this would be essentially the voltage we would read out in this voltmeter. So for a concentration cell, here is the Nernst equation where the standard cell potential is zero, so it's no longer appearing. And really the most important factor here is Q. So Q for this redox reaction is just the copper two plus ion of the product over the copper two plus ion of the reactant. So we have to determine in each of these half cells which one is producing the copper two plus and which one is using it as a reactant. And so if you want to think about in which direction the reaction will go, first we have one half cell with a lower concentration of copper two plus, another half cell with a higher concentration of copper two plus, and as the cell moves towards equilibrium, the concentrations will want to equalize. And so what that means then is the lower concentration of copper two plus wants to build up concentration, whereas the higher concentration wants to decrease copper two plus. In order to build up copper two plus in this left half cell, we're going to basically oxidize copper metal and so copper two plus will be a product. In the right half cell, we want to decrease copper two plus, and we can do that by reducing it to copper metal. And so here on the right side, copper two plus is a reactant. So then having assigned the product and the reactant concentrations, we can simply plug those in into the reaction quotient Q and we would determine that Q is equal to 0.1. Now we can take this value of Q and plug it into this equation for the cell potential of a concentration cell. And because we have two electrons being transferred in this overall redox reaction, N here is equal to two. And solving for the cell potential, we would determine that it is indeed non-zero and equal to 0 0.0296 volts. And this is indeed what we would measure if we looked at the voltmeter. The Nernst equation is also useful for watching how the cell potential changes as a reaction proceeds to completion where Q would change in value. And so we can think about this equation as a linear line where the cell potential would be our y variable and log of q would be the x variable. So the standard cell potential then would be the y-intercept and this line would have a negative slope that's equal to 0 0.0592 volts over the moles of electrons transferred. So in the plot here, we have cell potential along the y Along the x-axis, 
you'll see here different magnitudes for Q. But because these are by magnitudes, in reality, we're plotting the log of Q, and here are their values. For this plot, we're going to return to the zinc copper voltaic cell where the standard cell potential is 1.1 volt. So the overall redox reaction is again shown here. And then Q, the reaction quotient, would be the concentration of the zinc 2 plus product divided by the concentration of the copper 2 plus reactant. At the standard cell potential value, then this would be the y-intercept. So this is where log of Q would be 0, or Q is equal to 1. And not only does this happen at the standard state, but it would happen at any other concentrations as long as the copper 2 plus and the zinc 2 plus have equal molar concentrations. Again, this is a point where Q equals 1 and log of Q would be equal to 0. Then the cell potential would be equal to the standard cell potential. On the left side of this plot, this is when we have a larger concentration of the copper 2 plus reactant than the zinc 2 plus product. So in this regime, the Q will always be less than 1. And what that means mathematically then is that the log of Q will be a negative number. Coming back to the Nernst equation, if log of Q is a negative number, then this second term, where we have a minus sign times a negative number, will then become a positive contribution to the driving force. When Q is less than 1, or when our reactant concentration is greater than our product concentration, we'll have a situation where the cell potential will always be larger in value than the standard cell potential. On the right side of this plot, we have the regime where the product concentration now is greater than the reactant concentration. And this will mean that Q will be greater than 1. And then the log of Q will also be a positive number. Coming back to the Nernst equation, when Q is greater than 1, that means we're going to be subtracting this contribution from the standard cell potential. And so when Q is greater than 1, all the cell potential's values will be less than that of the standard cell potential. What this plot of the Nernst equation shows is that when we have reactants, the cell potential is at a maximum. And as reactants turn into products, the cell potential will continue to decrease until it reaches a point where the product and reactant concentrations are equal, and then that will have a standard cell potential value. And then as more product is formed, again, the cell potential will steadily decrease, eventually until it reaches a value of zero at equilibrium. In my final slide here, I'd like to just describe that progression again where we follow the changes in the cell potential as the concentrations of products and reactants vary. So in this table here, we are going to look at this column labeled 1 to determine its effect on the value of Q, which then will determine the sign for this term that includes the log of Q. And lastly, this will determine then what the value of the cell potential would be relative to the standard cell potential. Initially, when we start with a redox reaction, we have a high concentration of reactants. And then that means then that Q will be less than 1. And if Q is less than 1, then the second term in the Nernst equation will be negative. And subtracting a negative means we're going to have a positive contribution here, such that the cell potential will be greater in value than the standard cell potential. As the reaction proceeds, we reach a point where the concentration of the product and reactant metal ions are equal. At this point, Q will be equal to 1, and the second term, including the log of Q, will be 0. And so this is where now the cell potential 
will just be equal to the standard cell potential. As the reaction continues to move forward, now we have a higher concentration of products, and that means Q will be greater than 1. And then the second term with this log of Q will also be a positive number. And so that means then we're going to be subtracting away from the standard cell potential such that the cell potential will be less than the standard cell potential in value. So we can think of this as a start of a redox reaction moving forward through these different stages until we finally reach equilibrium where we would stop all net changes. And this is the point where the cell potential would be zero, Q would be equal to K, because when Q is equal to K, then that would be the same as E0 minus E0, which is equal to zero. Another way of thinking about this in terms of applications is that all batteries are voltaic cells. And so if you have a new battery, you have it charged with reactants. And eventually, as they get discharged and they turn into products, you reach a point where it hits equilibrium and then the battery no longer is able to do work or it's a dead battery. 